Well, I want to welcome you to our online worship service here at Russia Cornish Baptist Church, where for the past month and a half or so, we've been looking at the earliest chapters from the book of Revelation in the Bible in a series of messages called Lighting the Lamp. Uh, in the very first chapter of, of Revelation, the Apostle John, who's living in a sentenced exile on an island at the time, is, is doing his best to write down a vision that he received from Jesus after, of course, Jesus had been risen from the dead and gone back up into heaven. And in verse 11, he tells us that Jesus said this to him. He said, write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches. Or later he calls them the seven lampstands, which is where our title Lighting the Lamp comes from. Uh, and he says they're in the cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Those are the seven. And I'll just say this, I don't know quite how it worked because as I said, John was basically an island prisoner at the time. And so I would have thought that sending anything to anybody wouldn't happen very easily. Like maybe he called in a favor from someone. Uh, maybe he got himself in the good graces of one of the guards who did something for him. In any case, God must have provided a way because the book does get delivered the way that Jesus wants it to. And if you were to look uh, on an old map from, from that time period, it's not even hard to trace the route that uh, whoever the courier was took. It starts uh, just over on the mainland in Ephesus, so just off the island from where he was, where John was, and then it heads north along the coast to Smyrna and to Pergamum, then inland to Thyatira, and south again to Sardis, then Philadelphia, and finally Laodicea, the whole roundabout being less than 500 kilometers. What we now call the Book of Revelation got delivered to all of those churches. And along with the book, or included as part of the book really, and this is the part we've been focusing on here lately, Jesus also wanted uh, John to include a personalized letter to each of these kind of lampstand churches to basically tell them how he felt that they were doing, and in some cases sharing with them what needed to happen in order to get them back in line with the kind of church he wanted them to be. And so for the past five or six weeks, we've been basically reading other people's mail. Like we've been looking at, at Jesus' personalized letters to these seven historic first century churches, really in order to draw from them some of the insights that we might be able to glean into the kinds of things that Jesus might want to say to us in our church as well. And so this week we're reading from Revelation uh, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, which is Jesus' letter to the church at Sardis. It's not a long letter. It doesn't have to be for what God's about to tell them. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's still a very interesting letter. And this is what it says. Jesus tells John, write this letter to the angel of the church in Sardis. This is the message from the one who has the sevenfold spirit of God and the seven stars, which is a reference again to him. It's a reference to Jesus himself. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Now, just stop there for a minute, because that's quite a statement, right? Like, can you imagine reading that as a follower of Jesus, knowing that it came from Jesus himself? I mean, at least with some of the churches, he leads into it kind of gently, right? Like, he's like, you're good at this, uh, you're good at that, you're doing this thing well, but I just have this one thing to mention to you, like one little complaint, no big deal. But with Sardis, there's none of that. Like, he jumps right into it, and, and it's kind of like, you better sit down for this one, because here's the thing, and I, I don't know how else to break it to you, but you're not really with us anymore. <laughs> Literally, he tells them, you have a reputation for being alive. That's what people think when they look at you, but in actual fact, you're not alive. You're dead. I've looked for a pulse. I can't find one. And what he's really saying to the church when he says that is, friends, you have got a serious problem here that you don't know about. Nobody knows it. Nobody sees it. If you ask the people in the community even, they'd probably tell you, oh, those guys down, you know, at the little house church on the corner. Yeah, I, I, like I think they're doing all right. I see them coming and going there on Sundays. Uh, I, I see the lanterns on there several days a week, even into the late night. Uh, they have programs of potlucks and pie socials. They, they play their music and, and with their instruments and they wave banners and, and they behave themselves mostly. And as neighbors, they're pretty easy to get along with, actually. Like, they don't, they don't bother anybody. I, I think they're all right. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, the Lord says. That's the word on the street. But you're not. You're dead. 
your services are dead, your programs are dead, your worship is dead. Outwardly, you're busy with all your religious activities, but inwardly, there's no life in them anymore. You're just going through the motions now. You don't have any real sense of spiritual presence or spiritual power. It's kind of like the shell's here, but the nut is gone. And, and you know what, what's the most disturbing thing about that for me? It's that when I was trying to think of how to explain what it means for a dead or dying church to look like it's alive, I realized I didn't really have to because most of us have been in churches like that before, haven't we? Or we've heard about them anyway. We've maybe seen some of them. As a matter of fact, I, I doubt that there's another organization in the world that can so convincingly fake life and vibrancy like the church can at times. And you want to know why? It's because we've got a couple of things. We've got tradition and we've got religion. Like here in our part of the world, it's not uncommon to find churches that have been around for 100 years or even 200 years or more. Jeepers, the country that we live in has only been a country since 1867. That's when the Dominion of Canada was formed. But there are churches in our region, ours happens to be one of them, that predate Confederation, literally by decades. And one of the things that that tells me is that churches are really good at tradition. When we start something, we can stay at it for a long time. And we're good at the other thing we're good at, we're good at religion too. We can make up rules for people to follow with the best of them. And because of that, when you put that together, as long as we can still hold on to our traditions and to our religion, here's the thing. There's a good chance that nobody will notice for a while if for some reason the pulse of our relationship with God grows cold. Does that make sense? You know, right now I happen to be serving as the president of our parent denomination, the Canadian Baptist of Atlantic Canada. But years ago, before I came to Russia Cornish, I was serving the denomination in a different role as a member of something we called the Discovery Committee. And as part of the Discovery Committee, it was our job to provide resources and direction, particularly direction to some of our local churches. And while the model for what we were doing was constantly evolving and it was eventually replaced with something else and then it's been replaced with other things since, the core teaching block that we used to talk to churches about was really helpful. And it was something called the life cycle of a local church. It was something we borrowed with permission from, the top, from a top church life researcher at the time named George Bullard. And more recently, I've been hearing a few others talk about church life cycles too. And so it hasn't really gone away. I hear people like Tony Morgan and a few others talk about that, but George Bullard was one of the first. And we're not going to go into it in detail here today, but basically what Bullard's research showed him is that every church has a natural life cycle, just like every other living being does. And it starts with birth. I mentioned that our church has been around here for a long time, longer than any of us have even been alive. But if we could travel back, back in time to 1833 and sit in on some of the conversations that were being held around a small handful of, of dining room tables at the time. Like that's when a little group of people had this bold idea that there should be a church here in Russia Cornish to spread the good news of Jesus in the little farming and logging community that, we, that was here. And I mean, all they had that in the beginning, they didn't have much, right? All they had was a vision for it. But that's how it starts. It was how it started for us. Like that's our, that's our birth story. And then once the church was founded, they started inviting friends and neighbors to join them. And so they added to the vision they had, they added relationships. And then once a few people started coming, they decided to add some programs, you know, maybe a Sunday school, probably a mission society, a few other things. And, and at that point, it wasn't brand new anymore, right? Like it had moved out of the newborn stage and into kind of a childhood and then adolescent stage. Like growth happens quickly in those early years. And then as the church continued to grow, they realized probably that they needed to put some structure in place to oversee the vision and the relationships and the programs. And so they elected some leaders and appointed a treasurer and a secretary or whatever. And, and when all those things are in place and working well, according to Bullard, it's at that point that a church, any church, moves into its prime, into adulthood. And when a church is in its prime, this is the term in the life of the church when things are typically really going well. Like programs are full and growing and effective 
and meaningful for people. Uh, the church is growing in size. It's seeing new people come all the time. Lives are being changed. People are coming to know the Lord. They're being encouraged in their faith, their journey, their walk with the Lord. God is being honored in everything. People are genuinely committed to his purposes. And if a church is intentional about keeping it that way, you know what? They can stay there for a very, very long time. They don't ever have to come out of healthy adulthood. But as we know, that doesn't always happen. And so if a church isn't careful and it isn't paying attention to some of the small indicators that are usually out there, then again, according to what George Bullard discovered in his studies, his research, they can start, the church can start to slide down the other side from adulthood into maturity and then empty nest and retirement and old age. And if nothing is done to turn things around, eventually it leads to death, which for a church is when someone, you know, whoever is left, just make sure the heat and water get turned on off before the doors get locked, right? Like that's, that's what it represents. And now again, it doesn't have to happen that way with local churches. And, and if you know me, like you'll know that I'm kind of an optimistic person. Like I get, I get it from my father. Whenever anybody told my father that a storm was coming, he, he'd always say the same thing. He'd say, ah, I don't think it's going to amount to much. And sometimes he was even right. And I'm a bit like that. Like it's kind of in my nature to look on the bright side, to see the best in people, to expect good things to happen. And of course, the great thing about the life cycle of a church that makes it different from other life cycles is that at any point, a church can reverse the process and go back up into that prime adulthood phase again. But here's the reason that I wanted to share all of that with you. It's because when a church is in its prime at the peak of the, the life cycle, like way up here, it has these four big things working in its favor that I mentioned already. It has a vision for where it's headed and, and what the church is trying to do. It has relationships that are mostly healthy where the people are supportive of one another and, and building one another up in their faith. It has programs that are enhancing the work and facilitating the personal and spiritual growth for, for people of all ages, you know, the things that we do together. And, and it has some form of management for holding it all in place. Vision, relationships, programs, and management, those four. And when a church slips, usually unnoticed at first, from prime adulthood into maturity and on down that aging side of the life cycle, it's almost always because one of those four things starts to disappear. Do you know which one it is? Which one do you think it is? Research shows that the vast majority of the time, it's always the same. The first thing that goes is vision. A church begins to die when it's people stop dreaming new dreams, stop trying new things, stop creating new opportunities for ministry and just become satisfied with where they are and what is going on right now, which is a problem, isn't it? And here's why. It, you know, if relationships were the thing that slipped first, somebody would notice. Somebody would be like, hey, we're not, you know, we're not getting along the way we should. Something has to happen here. If the church started to eliminate all their programs, somebody would notice, wouldn't they? If management became a problem and suddenly we were overspending budgets or under-resourcing ministries, somebody's going to notice that. But because it's vision that slips away first, because everybody's still generally happy, things still seem to be going well, it's quite possible that nobody will notice, maybe for quite a while. And by the time they do, they're not even just in maturity anymore. They've slipped further down than that. Now, I met George Bullard years ago, and so obviously he wasn't around when God was writing his letter to the church in Sardis. But it seems like if he was, it, 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 he would have known exactly what was going on there, right? Like, this is, where, this is the kind of thing he's talking about. I know all the things you do, the Lord says in Revelation 3 and verse 1, and that you have a reputation for being alive, but, he says to the church in Sardis, you're dead. You've slipped over the edge. Nobody noticed. In fact, you're way down near the bottom of the life cycle, actually. And everybody's still just acting as if you were still up here. Like, then down in verse 2, he says, wake up. Strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. And then here's his prescription. He says, go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly, repent 
and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Friends, maybe this is a good point to stop and do a little bit of reflecting because the reality is that a church can continue to live off old visions and revelations and dreams for a while. And programs by their nature can carry themselves for a long time. But the reality is that unless we are intentional in our outlook, and really, I think COVID has given us a natural flex point for this. If we're willing to open up ourselves to new challenges and new possibilities and new directions that we feel God is leading us to consider, if we, if we neglect to do that, even when it seems unlikely, even when it means it will stretch us a little or change things a little or call on a deeper level of faith that we're used to exercising, if we neglect it, then eventually what is going to happen is that we will begin to lose our motivation and we will start to die on the inside, even though on the outside for a time, we'll still continue to look very much alive. There's a verse in Proverbs 29, verse 18, that says the, same, the, the very same thing. In the old King James, uh, that many of us grew up with, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. In the New Living Translation that we use most commonly, it translates it a bit differently. It says, when people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. And it's all really the same thing, because if we're not looking for our vision from God, listening for what it is that he wants us to do, we can go in all sorts of different directions that have nothing to do with where he wants us to be and who he wants us to be. And we can end up outside of his will altogether. Which brings us to these last few verses from the letter in Revelation 3. Because thankfully, God ends his letter with a message of hope and encouragement for the church, both for Sardis and for churches in our own generation. He says, yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white for they are worthy. And all who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life, but I will announce before my father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. Isn't that an encouraging ending? Like, see, the thing to keep in mind is that our God is not a punitive God. He's not looking for an opportunity to crack the whip and draw the line and punish his people. Like, friends, these are the people God gave his son for. Jesus died for the church. That's how much he loves us. And what he is saying is that for all who make the deliberate choice at whatever place on the life cycle the church is that you're part of, like for those who make the choice to turn their face toward him and look for his vision and dream new dreams and line their will up with his, our names are written already in the book of life. And someday when we go to be with him, he will announce to the whole company of heaven that he belongs to us and we belong to him. May we be a church that never stops dreaming new dreams of what the Lord wants us to do and do through us here in Russia Gornish and around the world as he gives us opportunity. Would you join me? Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the message of, the, of, of Jesus to the church at Sardis today. Thank you that you love that church enough to speak truth over them. And we take it as counsel for us as well. Give us an ongoing vision for what you want to do and what you want us to do as your representatives in this, this small part of your big world. We love you, Lord. We live for you. May your name be glorified in all that we do. And we pray all of that today in Jesus' name. Amen.